Hey y'all, Kevin Hutchison here with Realty Austin, and I am grateful to be a part of Stories Inside the Man Cave, a homegrown podcast just like my own business. Wake your ass up or take a damn nap. And we're the three best friends that anybody could have. It's time. I mean, Sean, you were twerking. That's going to happen. <laughs> Murph, don't be a dick all your life. This is uh, one, of the, one of the more fun podcasts I've ever done. Hey, I'll tell you what. If you're not talking about sports in the man cave, you... No, nah, I bet not. So you're not a man. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> You know, when you bring royalty on, you got to have a royal-esque type of introduction like that. D. Todd Haney, former Longhorn baseball great. Uh, You know, when you sent me those photos that we requested and talked about, did you have any idea that you would have this Hall of Fame-like introduction like that? I exceeded my expectations. (laughs) Man, I was just sending you some, just kind of like, hey, I'll, uh," you said, give me something that, Tells a story about you. So, you know, I included family. I included uh, coaching. And then, of course, I had to include the fight that we had with the Cubs just because uh, the picture was so good. Yeah, speaking of the Cubs, so Todd played, and we'll, we're going to dive all into this. It's a great story. Uh, Longhorn in at 86, 87, and, and middle infielder, second baseman. Hell, he, he could play anything. Got into coaching. But in the background, where he spent some time as a Chicago Cub, I know I'm biased toward Wrigley Field, but that is, and I know I said it earlier, that's the best backdrop that anyone could have in any type of man cave. I mean, am I wrong? <laughs> yeah, you're not wrong. Yeah, because that was the first thing you mentioned when uh, when we turned the camera on was the uh, was how great the backdrop was. So yeah, I might have to uh, I might have to keep it, or I think I need to probably put it in every room in the house. Probably. <laughs> that's not a bad idea. Yeah, so this is going to be a lot of fun, you know, and episode 132 brought to you by our guy, Jim Saxton, State Farm Insurance Agency. He's really good to Austin, good to his roots in Westlake, and he's good to all former Longhorns. Uh, I know he played football, but he takes care of everybody, he and his staff, they do. I, I don't know where to begin, but right now, let's start kind of start where you are now and back it up to those great years when really... The city of Austin was different, and you really became a foundation of uh, Coach Gus's Texas baseball program. You're coaching right now at the University of Mary Harden Baylor, who which has really good facilities all around. Kind of that journey where you are now as an assistant for the Crusaders, because you've coached in a lot of places in the baseball family, which is so strong. They know who Todd Haney is. Well, yeah, it's uh, it's it's interesting. You know, once I retired in 2000, uh, we had a family business, a company called Profiles International. Uh, we sold assessments and worked in the family business for a couple of years. And then all of a sudden, the uh, the 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 need to do something with baseball, uh, I just you know, it's in the blood. Yeah. And so I had a select program for a number of years. Uh, while my son was here in Waco, and then once he went off to school, sold that. And then wanted to scratch some itches and and look at college professionals some different opportunities. And so, yeah, so I'm at uh, University of Mary Hardin Baylor now. Uh, great school. Like you said, great facilities. Uh, the leadership is fantastic. Our president actually played, actually played growing up with him, summer baseball. Wow. And uh, he played at B County, which is now Coastal Bend. Right. And then he played at Mary Hardin Baylor. So obviously he's a baseball guy. And he brought in a couple of years ago, he brought in uh, uh, Mike Stosky, our head coach from mm-hmm. Concordia, who had gone on a five year run of the most wins in D3. Uh, so he he just said, look, football's fantastic. Uh, you know, obviously won the national championship uh, in 16, 18. And then this past year, right. uh, basketball's done a great job. And so he wanted to um, bring in, you know, the the best coaching that he could. So he brought in coach Stosky, who's doing a great job. 
And, uh, and I met Coach Toski and really loved his vision, loved his character, uh, and liked what he was wanting to accomplish and felt like we were going to be a really good fit together, uh, which I feel we have been. And, you know, the program is headed in a really good direction. Now, for those who are, aren't sure, um, University of Mary Harden Baylor is up the road north of Austin, about 45 minutes in a community called Belton. It's Belton Temple. It's south of Waco. For those who are either watching or, or listening uh, uh, outside the great state of Texas, uh, tremendous campus. They have invested a lot of money, as Todd mentioned, into all their facilities and great success. You know, it, it's everywhere. You have to invest into your program. But to have success, and, that, and that's something, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, something you learned at a younger age because – you come from a deep baseball background. You have to invest time to be really good at this. And this is – now, if this is wrong, this is what I, I remember. You're a son of a four-time All-American in, in the college baseball level. My dad is is and will o- probably be the only time. He's the uh, only four-time All-American in Sam Houston history. Wow. So, yeah, center fielder, left-handed hitter. Um, just, yeah, phenomenal athlete played, uh, had an opportunity maybe to play some football, but decided to go baseball and, uh, made a great, uh, decision to play at Sam Houston and then played a couple years of minor league baseball before he tore his knee up. And back then, you know, he, uh, he had surgery and was out for months and then just lost some speed. Whereas today he'd probably have it scoped on and be back in four weeks and, you know, no, no, no different. That's it's pretty impressive. To, to hear that story because he probably started that foundation. And what, so I have to ask you, what was it like being the son of, of a, a guy who was such an accomplished college baseball player at a young age? Because there are some, and I'm not calling out individuals. You just see it. You hear about it. You've seen it because you coached at pretty much every level and select. When you put too much pressure on a young baseball talent, as a parent, what I, I mean, I don't know if there's a wrong or right answer, but what what is the best parenting style that you've seen that helps kids not burn out of the game? Well, there are definitely some wrong answers. <laughs> <laughs> we, we've seen plenty of those, no doubt about it. And I think you hit the nail there when you said the pressure that you put on. And that's the great thing about my father was he never put any pressure, but he was always there to support you. And if you want to go. You know, if hey, Dad, it's eight o'clock. You want to go throw the baseball? He pick up his glove and say, "Let's go." Or hey, I want. I was notorious for hey, one more, one more, one more. So I mean, his poor arm, man, that thing is dragging his knuckles now because I took so much BP. But he was always there and he was always supportive. But it wasn't necessarily pushing. It was helping and and being uh, you know a good role model, but also supporting. But The other thing that's very interesting, my older brother, who's two years older, he played at Texas Mm A&M, and he played a couple years of minor league baseball also. Um, You know, for people that know me, I'm 5'8". I've always said I was 5'9". My older brother is 6'1", left-handed hitter. So, I mean, he was really good. So, not only did I have my dad working with me, but I was also working with my older brother, so, I mean, I was always getting pushed on that end, which I think helped me get to the big leagues. And that that's that's pretty impressive because, you know, there's you had guys or men or mentors who happen to be your closest members of your inner circle kind of mentoring you along the way. Because, uh, man, I see it all the time. I, I, I see more good parenting, but I, you you mentioned it. You see too much – of these kids who, because baseball right now, and we'll get into that in segment two about the future of it, that you don't, you need retention. And I think bad parenting as far as that pressure. And you've seen, you've seen some talent, I'm sure, that probably should have continued in the game. They just were burnt out. And, and am I, is that too far-fetched? Oh my gosh, no. I mean, it happens daily. You know, parents start pushing them at a young age and they're ahead of the curve when they're 10 years yeah. old. And they think they're going to play in the big leagues. And they start talking about D1 scholarships and this and that. And it's like, look, let them, let them play. Let them, you know, go enjoy. Let them play mini sports so they can develop. And if they really love the game, they're going to practice. And that's the hardest, hardest part is, you know, my dad never had to push me because I pushed myself. I was the one out 
and the, and the guys still laugh from Panola Junior College where I play. They still laugh about we had a, a reunion and they still laugh about me hitting in the cage at night. And I would pull my car up and turn the lights on because we didn't have any lights. But I wanted to hit. And, you know, I mean, I might have gone 0 for 4, so I really wasn't happy about that. So I'm in the cage hitting with my lights on so I could get my work in. And, you know, that wasn't because my dad pushed me. That was because I wanted to be the best player I could be. And maybe I was frustrated. Maybe I just wanted extra work. But you figure out what you need to do. And that's – if you listen to any story, and I know you've had a ton of podcasts. I know you've talked to a lot of people. And – they're not being pushed and pushed into the ground. They're trying to go, you know what? I need to work hard. I need to throw harder. So I'm going to go get this tennis ball or I'm going to go get this football or whatever it is. And I'm just going to go throw it and I'm going to, I'm going to get better. And that obviously you mentioned Panola and Carthage, Texas. That's in deep East Texas, great baseball league for junior college. So that, that work ethic you just mentioned allowed you the opportunity or afforded you the opportunity, so to speak, as you earned it to go to the University of Texas and play for a legend. I want to bring up this picture right here, if I can not allow technology to <laughs> win, this, win this battle. But Coach hey, Gus, still with us. He's He was your coach in 86 and 87. When you stepped foot on the University of Texas campus, and Dish Falk at that time was about 11 years old, how did, would you describe – how hard that turf was because you weren't you coming from a grass field in junior college and high school. How did you adjust? Because middle infield, that's tough to play on a hard surface. <laughs> yeah, you got that right. <laughs> that's hilarious. I wasn't expecting that was the direction you were going, but you were a hundred percent right. That stuff was hard. It was bouncy. I remember the first couple of weeks I had shin splints. I didn't even know what they were, but I was like going, I went to the trainer and I'm like, my shins are killing me, man. I'm like, I don't know what's going on. And he's like, yeah, it's the turf. So, you know, work through that. Good old Eddie day and spanky, our trainers. Um, but yeah, work through that. But yeah, so just took a lot of ground balls. And I mean, it was fun because when that ball would bounce up, you had to figure out, am I going to go get it? Am I going to get a short hop or what am I going to do? And, you know, sometimes you get it, sometimes it bounces over your head. And, you know, I loved it when teams came in from the North to play us and, you know, you hit a line drive to the outfield and it would bounce over their head and go all the way to the wall and you get in the park home run just because they weren't used to it. But man, you were hundred percent right. That stuff was hard and bouncy. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, all I only experience I have with it were those summer camps that uh, Coach Gus would have, and he would show up for one day for probably a couple hours, and you know it'd be fun for us young kids growing up in Austin. And I think I think you were out there in '86 or summer of '80 or yeah, I think I think yeah, I, oh yeah, Coach Gus, we you know he'd eat his peanut butter and honey sandwiches with his uh, big old glass of iced tea, man. He did that daily. It was awesome. <laughs> Oh, my God. And he still does it from what I hear. And so to give you an idea where, who Todd played with, you know, back then is the same as it is now. The expectation was Omaha. And they had just come off a, a stretch of where Texas probably could have or were in position to win several national championships in a row from what, 82, 83, 84, 85. And yeah, then 80, it, was, it was a oh. tremendous run. You you guys were really good in 86, but ran into, I think, Pepperdine at back when it was a 48 team field. That that feeling that you guys had in 86, how it ended, which pushed you guys into 87, which was a great year. Well, we were we were really good in 86, yeah. but uh, it was actually Arizona came to our region. Oh, Arizona, yeah, and beat us. And I mean, you know, Joe McGrain. But actually, I got my first big league hit off of. So, you know, maybe some payback a little bit there. I'm sure it's not a big deal on his end. But uh, <laughs> Joe McGrain, Tommy Henzo, I mean, they had a number of big league guys. And it, it was devastating. I mean, the expectation was you go to Omaha every year and we fell short. And, but we had a great team. But like yeah. I said, you know, you look back now and Arizona won the World Series. You know, obviously they were really good. So you got to give credit where credit is due on that end. But, yeah, it did propel us in 87 to make sure that, hey, that's not going to happen again. We're going back to Omaha where we belong. 86, uh, Greg Swindell, Zeke, 
uh, who does a phenomenal job with Keith Moreland on the Longhorn Network. I, I, I think the best in the business. Yeah, yeah definitely. They're, they're great. He was your ace pitcher. But you had Kurt Krippner. Help me out because I'm, I'm forgetting names. But the lineup was staff, pitching staff always. Is it usually is at Texas. That's why you say it was disappointing because you guys were did have a great team. But Arizona was just absolutely loaded. And I remember that night. I think it went 10 innings against Pepperdine, who was played, ended up eliminating Texas that night. It was awful uh, for you guys. And, but to have that, I, th- I feel like the central region that year was loaded, yeah, absolutely yeah, loaded. Like, what was that? What was that uh, when you guys were talking about it and you watched Arizona win it all in 86? What, I mean, how much better were they? I mean, because th- I remember they were hitting bombs during that regional. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's one of those things where, you know, they were a great team. Like I said, Pepperdine was a quality team. We were, I mean, you know, obviously you can look and say anybody can win. Arizona got hot at the right time. They played great baseball. They were a great team. They won the World Series. So great job by them. But, man, when, you know, how much better were they? They were better in the regional, (laughs) you know, and they beat us. So, you know, I'm not going to sit here and be like, oh, we were better. But they, you know, yeah. I mean, they, they were better because they beat us. So, yeah. you know, good job by them. I, I know we were a really good team and, and uh, you know, and we fell short. That was still a fun ride. And then 87 was a lot of fun because it was back then the old Southwest Conference. You guys in Arkansas, and correct me if I'm wrong, the, the regular season title, didn't it come down to the series in Fayetteville? Oh, yeah. Yeah, so that was uh, – yeah, we you know, we both ended up in the World Series. Uh, so that was – and it was funny because, man, we played there in Arkansas, and their fans, whew, they were – they, uh, they were out in left field, you know, out beyond the outfield, and there was uh, uh, a lot of uh, colorful language, and there was a <laughs> lot of things being thrown onto the field. Uh, so it, what a great atmosphere. And I, I loved our rivalry with Arkansas. It was so good. Uh, such a fun time when they played, you know, when they played, uh, um, at, at, uh, at the dish, you know, it was awesome. We had the, the stands packed and we had the outfield packed as well. So it was, it was a lot of fun. Um, but I ended up, my roommate in AAA for a couple of years was Jimmy Kramers, who was a catcher there. And so it's, it's funny talking about it with him and playing against some other guys. Uh, so, you know, a lot of guys that played at UT ended up going and playing professionally. A lot of guys at mm-hmm. Arkansas played professionally. Uh, so, yeah, it was, uh, that was a lot of fun. Now, we look at these photos in front of us, to the right of us, uh, the people watching this. Coach Gus, all the umpires loved him. He always had something. He's had dry humor. He's still that way. Um, everybody joked that Coach Gus would bring his own umpires to the regionals and to Omaha, and they were two well-known umpires. But when you look at these pictures, what are some of the memories that that return that constantly that you remember of that great of him and, and, and being able to play for him? Uh, just the expectation every day to come out and and you better play at a high level and practice at a high level. And, and that's what I really took from him was just, man, show up and give it everything you got. And we had so much talent yeah. that, you know, if there's drop off in your play, I mean, I, I always tell him, but the one time he walked by me and he said, you better start hitting or I'm going to get somebody else in there that will. And that was it. And he just kept walking. And I'm like, oh, man, I better start hitting. So, uh, so, you know, he didn't have to. He wasn't a man of a lot of words, but the words he used certainly impacted you. Um, and, and for me, I really liked the way that he made you believe that you need to be better than, than where you think you are. So, you know, we might play whatever team that might be that came down for spring break. And if you remember, we played double headers like no. every day during spring break. So, I mean, we played a lot of baseball and we might win six to two and you're like, Hey, we won great. Good job. And he comes in and just yelling and you know, you're better than that. And they don't belong on the field with you. And, I'm like, you know what? You're right, man. That's a good call. So the, just the expectations, the the uh, approach of daily going out and, and, and basically proving your worth 
and then going out and winning baseball games that, you know, I, great man, uh, a tremendous coach. And uh, boy, am I just so happy and, and fortunate and blessed that I had an opportunity to play at University of Texas and for Coach Gus. That, that's amazing. Even looking at these pictures, it, it brings back good memories because I was a few years younger than you. Um, and it's just fun watching that. Um, I got to pull up some other photos of you. This now we're going to talk about post Texas uh, again. Um, this these photos right here. Back in the day, uh, trading cards were a big deal. They then they kind of died out. Now they're making a return. So I want to know what can what's the value on these? What can we get for these nowadays in this modern market of trading cards? Man, it's like Bitcoin, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Just hold on to it and let it increase, especially the the A ball Wausau Timbers card. You know, me <laughs> catching, which I never caught. I just thought it'd be funny to act like I was a catcher. Yeah. <laughs> so these this kind of ties in the, the the poses back then on every sport, mainly football and baseball cards were re absolutely hilarious, but. This kind of ties into what you said earlier. You said, man, I am five foot eight, five foot nine on a good day. Um, but you play like you're six feet tall. You, you want to you want to you just had that grit. So you're selected in the 38th round in the June amateur draft. And I'm sure that not the only person who believed you're going to play on the big show, get the call up was you. What was that? Is that accurate? And how did you work yourself into, like, for example, the Cubs, Wrigley Field? I mean, you you had a, a pretty decent professional career. Well, I appreciate that. Yeah. So for me, you know, I looked at it as as an opportunity. You know, once I was drafted, I'm like, oh, okay, so somebody somebody thinks I can play. So I'm like, all right, that and that's all you need is that yeah. one person. So for me, I'm going to go out and and I'm going to give it everything I have every day, but also I'm going to learn. Like what? I, and so I, I talk to different uh, general managers, different coaches. What do I need to work on? What do I need to be better at? And then I would go work on those things. Yeah. And so for me, I knew my strength was I was a really good hitting for average guy. Um, I was uh, I was a little above average speed. I needed to work on defensive uh, work, so I got uh, I got busy on that, um, and ended up. I mean, I think my second year in the rookie ball, I made like thirty errors, you know, one hundred and fifty games. So I mean, it was not good. Um, but in the next few years, I was down to like four errors. So you know, I, I really took advice. I took criticism, and for me, I just wanted to have no regrets in my career. I wanted to be the best player I could be. I wanted to get everything I could out of my skill set. And then I also wanted to take advantage of any and every opportunity that I was, uh, that I was given or earned, should I say. And so, you know, that was it, man. I just, you know, I played rookie ball. I played a ball. Um, you know, I played winter ball in Venezuela, Puerto Rico, mm -hmm. Mexico. I played anywhere and everywhere I could just trying to market myself and, and trying to figure out how to get to the big leagues and so, um, so yeah, I mean, it was, it was a grind. I was a grinder. Um, but you know, like you said, I mean, just, Hey, go, go take advantage of the opportunity that you're, uh, that you're given. So in your long resume of coaching, how was that translated? Because I know with, uh, our, our buddy Ty Harrington, you, you with there at Texas state for, for so long and did a great job. He coached with them paired up with him and then, Everywhere else you've been, including Mary Harden Baylor, when you t do these players, this younger generation, are, have you been able to talk to them about that? Hey, listen, be a grinder, do go above and beyond as you did, and it does pay off at, at some point. Well, so that's why I really like the college level. That's why it really fits me well. So I love teaching. That's the one thing I really enjoy doing is trying to give back. But I love teaching because I always was very uh, respectful and very thankful for those individuals that took the time for me. There was a number of people, you know, I was told no many times. There was a number of people that really I would talk to about, Hey, how do I get faster? How do I throw harder? And they just wouldn't give me the time of day because they were more worried about 
the 6'5 guy that ran a 6'5 and threw 90. And that's okay. But there were certain individuals that took the time to say, hey, you know what, there's this kid here that really wants to get better and I'm going to help him. And so, you know, I'm very appreciative to those individuals. So obviously I have a soft spot in my heart for kids that are grinders like me and kids yeah. that maybe are undersized or kids that, you know, they just work really hard and you want to help them out so that they have no regrets in their career. No, that's, so, that's I mean, it, it's, it's, it's taking, you know, what coach Gus taught me about expectations and how to win, how to go out and win baseball games. It's working with Ty Harrington. It's, you know, different coaches and different times that just mold you into it and then learning and growing from a coaching. I mean, I, you know, early on I was probably a little tougher uh, than I might have should have been just because I knew what I went through and I expected everybody was like me. And once I figured out that everybody's like me, then you have to take a step back and just help them be the best player they can be with what they want to accomplish. And that that's a tough I, – I can see that being tough as far as the realization – that I think everybody has different levels of drive, so to speak. And if anybody, high school baseball prospects, I can say this. I don't know if you can because you're NCAA school, but I'll say it for you. If you're watching this podcast, take a visit to Belton, Texas, UMHB. Uh, go visit their pro baseball program because if you really want to learn from a guy who has this – True high level business, uh, almost said business. Yeah, business acumen too, but <laughs> baseball acumen, uh, and learn to grind and play hard. UMHB is where Todd Haney is, and you can learn from him and that and that coaching staff. Uh, so there's my recruiting pitch. While wow, Todd is, yeah, uh, man, you're hired. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Next in the mail. Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> recruiting one on one. We just did it, and Todd Haney didn't say a word. <laughs> good job man you may be a guilty by association over here i'm not <laughs> sure but one of the best parts of segment one always is the man cave story but we got to do a, a special activity in, in the man cave and this is what i'm talking about paying homage to a product which helps all men look look good feel good <laughs> Yeah, we're covering about every topic imaginable here at Man Stories Inside the Man Cave, including manscaping. Manscaped.com is so popular that they have their own periodical and newspaper. In their top headline, We Say Balls, is pretty popular nowadays. And, you know, they really attracted me so much so that I, I love the products. And they sent me this entire package I'm going to show you. Well, the premier products of this box i just showed you the performance package 4.0 this bad boy the lawnmower 4.0 take a listen that is the sound of absolutely tremendous manscaping in the man cave so today as you're watching this episode i encourage you to jump on to manscaped.com and look for the performance package 4.0 you'll get the lawnmower 4.0 trimmer it is smooth and you just feel like a piece of silk afterwards and you feel clean personally let me let me show you what i love the most right here the ball deodorant i know the light's a little bright here but the ball deodorant it smells like sweet mahogany and pheromones. Todd, it's a conversation I never thought would even be uh, maybe on the high uh, hierarchy of conversation topics, but manscaped.com, go to that website and 20% off. Not a bad deal as we try to stay clean in this world. 20% off, man. What a deal. <laughs> and there it is the, the promo Damn. code man <laughs> 20, right there <laughs> All right. 
It's good for locker rooms, by the way. Yeah. Oh, yeah, no doubt. <laughs> Stop. We're going to take a quick break. On the other side, we're going to talk about your alma mater, the, the current Longhorns, and a few sprinkled in topics and have more fun with the Todd Haney. And that is coming up on the other side of this break. For all of your insurance needs, look no further than our primary sponsor, Jim Saxton State Farm Insurance Agency. The ATX OG has been insuring Austin for over three decades. And get this, Jim Saxton is a Longhorn legacy. He is the son of the late, great James Saxton, who was a Heisman finalist. Be sure to give him a call or better yet, visit his website, saxtoninsurance.com and tell him that the stories inside the Man Cave Boys recommended you. This is JJ Gotch, CEO of the Austin Gamblers. And segment two of Stories Inside the Man Cave is next. This ball hammered to left in the breeze. Get out of town, Longhorns walk-off winner. All right, so the reason why I played that, Todd, uh, that was from the second game, the back end of that uh, two-game set with Air Force. Uh, Texas had hit a slump and had, had been, I'd say, what, 500 ball since they lost uh, Witt and had such a great start. So the reason why I played that and still used it is simply because I think that is the point to which, after being dismantled, I think that's the game where it's just, all right, they had enough, it's time to grow up type moment. Is is that a fair assessment of that that moment of that walk-off win against Air Force in that second game? Well, you know, we certainly hope so. Um, you know, you go through ups and downs during the season and you yeah. certainly do have some defining moments. And I certainly hope that is a defining moment that can create some momentum and, you know, and obviously build like, Hey, we were down, we were struggling. We found a way to win a ball game. Um, you know, maybe a game that maybe we shouldn't have won. And now let's build off of that and, uh, and get some positive uh, energy going and figure out how to win baseball games moving on. Segment two here with uh, Todd Haney brought to you by farmhousedelivery.com, an ATX-based company. They source uh, organic produce, Texas-grown meats, and create meal kits. Uh, go to the website. I, 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 basically, they have stocked half my refrigerator. Uh, and just in one note on organic produce, you better eat it within three or four days. That's just, good. <laughs> That's just my experience. It's, <laughs> just, yeah, I'll get down there sooner than later. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I got you. I'll, I'll be there. Yeah, I'll save some for you. Yeah. They, they, they give a lot. I mean, they put nice. a lot in your delivery. Um, go to farmhousedelivery.com and use the promo man cave, two separate words for 20% off of your first order. And, and Todd, as far as to elaborate more on Texas, um, they just got through, they, they put the, Pulled the brooms out on Baylor and and scored a, a ton of runs. I thought pitching was really good in the management of it. And I know you're you're busy coaching at UMHB, but from what you know, what you may have seen, are you encouraged by as they head into right now as we're recording it? They're down in the Valley playing Rio Grande Valley, but a big time series here in Austin against uh, Oklahoma State. I mean, are you are you encouraged from that? what the streak they're on now? Well, you know, like we talked about with Air Force, you know, creating, yeah. getting some momentum and taking it into the weekend with Baylor. Uh, and, and it's – I'm really excited about where the hitting is. Yeah. You know, Texas has always had great pitching. Yeah. Hitting has kind of come and gone on different years. So, I mean, I'm really excited about the athleticism and the hitters that they have. Obviously, I'm a hitter, so that's why I'm excited about that. Uh, but I really like the lineup that they're putting out on a daily basis. I mean, there's some guys, there's speed, there's power. I mean, there's some really good guys. So I think the offense can carry them. And obviously, you know, wit, losing wit, that was a big deal. That's a huge blow to the pitching staff. But, I mean, I really think, you know, Texas has the arms to, uh, uh, to do what they need to do to make a really good run and get to Omaha this year. So I, personally, I feel like, Team-wise, they have what it takes. 
not only on the mound, but also, you know, offensively and defensively. And I think hopefully what we see are some games offense is going to win it for them and some games pitching is going to win it for them. You know, in the past, a lot of times it was pitching winning it for them. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's what we'll, we'll find out how good they are. Well, Find out what they're made of. We know they're a good team, but find out what they're made of because Oklahoma State's, uh, I think, the highest-ranked team in the country from the Big 12, and they're playing really good, and it, they'll be in Austin. Um, hope to see you down. Well, no, you'll have your own series. Uh. Yeah, yeah. We're playing our last weekend series. Uh, we have Howard Payne this weekend, and we start our conference tournament next weekend. That's, what's the name of that conference? The a American South? Is that what it's called? American Southwest Conference, ASC. There you go. There you go. Yeah. I knew I was yeah. on the lines, but I knew I was wrong. Some fact. <laughs> but, hey, bittersweet topic. Uh, good memories of this guy. And it was just so sudden. Uh, a great Longhorn. Uh, one of my first uh, growing up. I, I Honestly, he was the first talent in all of baseball that I remember that was a great pitcher, great hitter. And he played with – did he play on both of the teams that you were on at Texas? Yes. Okay. So all I know, uh, we, we lost him, uh, from what I understand, passed away in his sleep. The guy, and I know this is fresh and I hate to throw it on you, but we got to remember this guy. He was pretty significant to the Texas baseball program. Yeah, no doubt. No doubt. Man, that guy. So, I mean, just a great person. I mean, really funny guy. Um, I mean, I had a lot of good times. We hung out when we were at Texas. I played uh, – I was in the Cape one summer, and he was uh, in Orleans. I think I was in Harwich. Uh, and then I played with him in the minor leagues. So, you know, I spent a lot of time with KG and, uh, and really enjoyed him. Um, and, he, yeah, you're right, man. What a talent. You know, two-way talent. I mean, the guy could have pitched in the big leagues, I really believe. Uh, he just – he was really good, uh, you know, through low 90s, great slider. But he just loved hitting home runs. And so he he would rather hit than pitch. And, I mean, we all told him, like, KG, like, you could probably pitch in the big leagues, man. He's like, yeah, yeah, whatever, man. I, You know, I'm hitting bombs, which he did. <laughs> but if you ask anybody, I mean anybody, Doug Lindauer, Doug Hodo, I mean anybody, Swindell, whoever, they will tell you Kevin Garner was famous for yelling at the pitcher when he got a 2-0 curveball or 2-0 changeup or 3-1 curveball changeup, and then he'd get out, he'd be in the dugout yelling to throw him a fastball. <laughs> I mean, notorious. And we're like, KG, they're not going to throw you a fastball so you can hit a home run, man. Like, you're going to get changeups. So that was what he was notorious for, uh, for being really upset when they wouldn't throw him a 3-1 fastball. <laughs> he was a big guy. Big guy. He was a big guy. Now, wasn't he a switch hitter too? No, he was just lefty, left-handed, okay. uh, left-handed hitter, right-handed thrower. Okay, that's what. Okay, that's what. Okay, yeah. My memory's not that bad, but those little small details are not as good as they once were. <laughs> hey, we're getting older, man. You know, yeah, we are. It's kind of like that Toby Keith song, "Not as good as I once was." <laughs> yeah, there, you go. there you go. So, thoughts and prayers. And I hate to be cliche, but it's still very fresh. And it's still, I can't imagine what uh, Kevin's family, uh, immediate family and friends like you. And I, and obviously for all of you who are teammates of him, uh, man, a uh, heartfelt feelings and prayers to all of you to be. Yeah, honest. definitely. Yeah. I appreciate you saying that for sure. 100%. Um, we mentioned earlier the future of baseball and I, and I want to show you something and I, I really, I can't wait to have your take on this. I'm biased, love the game. I will love it regardless. Uh, my ability to play it was limited to uh, summer league and high school. That's as far as I took it. But it's a great game. So uh, Mike Caps, the announcer, play-by-play uh, -play guy for uh, the Round Rock Express, he uh, wrote a book called Grinders. It's about people like you. And we had I, – I hosted it for him. Uh, we did hosted an eight podcast, and we had Scipio Spinks on. The, uh, the, the former pitcher who was oh, a yeah. grinder. Mm -hmm. I asked him about how can baseball reach African American kids more, and what's it going to take? Because we're seeing a big drop off in America of I, I, I think kids. Pat, maybe I think it's about ten years old. 
and inner city kids, the, the interest in it is really dropping off. This is what Scipio said uh, in, in this episode we did for Grinders, uh, Mike Cat's book. It's going to take guys like myself, Deacon Jones, uh, 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 Ralph Gar, uh, Tory Hunter, guys like that to go into the inner cities and talk to these kids and let them see, feel, and touch us and let them know this is what we did. You know, reading about it, it, it these younger guys in, in the front office and stuff, they have no idea. They, they can go in there, talk analytics all they want about what it takes to be. These young black players need to see and they need to hear from us the experience that we had. And, and we need to make it exciting to these kids so they can go out and, and, and pursue the game of baseball on the big league level. It, it makes a good point for you. You've recruited kids. You're recruiting kids currently. You develop kids, all levels. Um, is it is it an exaggeration to think that or to say that I'm concerned about the future at, at re retention, including inner city kids? Oh, no, yeah, no doubt. Uh, and, I, man, I think I, I love what he said. I think that's a great point uh, for individuals like himself. Uh, to go in and, and touch and feel and talk about it and, and the experience and how great baseball really is. Um, you know, and the, and the hard part a lot of times, especially with younger kids as a whole, is just, you know, basketball and football. And, I mean, you know, they're so fast. Like, like I love basketball. Yeah. Basketball is one of my favorite sports, and I still – would say that was one of my favorites because it was so much fun. I mean, you're just constantly moving up and down the court and it's a fun sport. And, you know, when you look at the NBA and you look at, uh, you know, all the music and I mean, it's, it's a, it's a cool sport yeah. and it's a lot of fun. So, you know, I can see how uh, uh, younger kids would be drawn to playing that, you know, but at the same time, the opportunities in baseball, you know, we need to do a really good job. You know, I'm on the board of uh, Major League Baseball Players Alumni Association, and we're doing a really good job. We have uh, legend, legends for youth clinics. So we do free clinics all over the U.S. We do it all over the world and just spreading the, the you know, the greatness of baseball. And so once kids are able to uh, uh, go out and play the game and have fun and enjoy it, and see how much fun it is and learn about the strategies and the in intricacies of the game, you know, I think that that helps them. So it's just, it's just spreading the message. Yeah, I think you're right. In marketing, I feel like MLB is trying something different. Uh, you know, this is something that I don't think, I don't know if you have, if you can voice your opinion on this, but uh, I think it needs to start with how we uh, hall of fame, induction let's uh let's let's revise that because that is archaic uh it's just too much of a journalist input on things the great game needs to grow with who we are now as a country we're very diverse um you coached and played with uh, a ton of latino players from the dominican everywhere it was some of the greatest people and greatest ball players oh 100 love, love them yeah i mean i had great experiences with, you know, with a lot of international players. And, you know, I've gone in the last probably five to eight years, I know Zeke did quite a bit as well, a lot of traveling. You know, I've been to China, Australia. I've been to uh, Costa Rica, Nicaragua. Um, so, I, you know, I've been Italy, um, yeah. Germany. So I've been to a number of these different countries. And, and baseball is growing. And, it, and you said it. When you look at baseball today, you see a, a – huge international flavor in the game, which is fantastic for the growth of the game. So it's, it's getting there. Um, it's certainly growing in some other countries, Australia, you know, obviously Japan, we know, but I mean, Korea, uh, Germany starting to really get a foothold on it, Italy. So there's a number of countries where it's really growing and, uh, and impacting and, and, and for future generations, there will be more, international players coming in. There's no doubt about it. 
I, I love seeing that. And that what you what what all Todd has mentioned is uh, taking years and years and years of investing time and resources into these other countries. And it, it's amazing. It's it's good to see. It. I'm glad you said that. And that kind of leads us here to the end, my friend. Uh, a segment that we all love and that because uh, there's so much negativity in this world. Let's end it with this. Hey, Ben, tell me something good. Hey, tell me something good brought to us, to all of us, by uh, our latest, greatest sponsor, Honest Air Conditioning and Plumbing. They serve Hutto, Cedar Park, Georgetown, part of North Austin, Round Rock, and some other, all those communities over there. Their, their motto is old school boys, good old boys, that uh, where a handshake still means something, and they're truly locally owned and veteran-owned Honest AC and Plumbing. Hopefully, people get that done here pretty soon. It's it's about to be. We know how hot it gets here in about four weeks. <laughs> yes, we do. And I will be in Victoria, British Columbia, coaching up in the West Coast League. Oh my God, you're going back. That's beautiful. <laughs> yeah, I love it, man. It's man. a great. Uh, I know we got to go, but we, you know, I, so I coach up in Victoria, British Columbia, in the West Coast League during the summer. It's a summer collegiate wood bat league. Um, I bring a number of Texas kids up there. Uh, just, you know, blue collar players, yeah. and, uh, man, it is beautiful. If you have an opportunity to come visit us in the summer, please do, man. It is a great place. So how would we get, would you fly into, uh, Seattle? Fly into Seattle. And then you can take a ferry, uh, like a two and a half hour ferry, which is awesome. Or like a 30 minute, uh, uh, puddle hopper across yeah. to, uh, Victoria. So Victoria is on Vancouver Island. And uh, it's just, yeah, it's a beautiful city, uh, man, just great people. So uh, we lead the league in attendance. We draw like 2,500 a night. Yeah, it's pretty cool. And when we, uh, when we do fireworks on Saturday, we'll draw 5,000. So the kids love it. And, uh, and like I said, the weather is 65, 70 degrees. So, yeah, when it's 110 down here, just know I'm putting a hoodie on when it gets a, a little chilly up there. And your wife yeah. goes with you? Oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, my wife is the uh, the true definition of a baseball wife. She's been Love with it. me. We've been married Love thirty it. years now. So she went to she went to Puerto Rico, Venezuela, Mexico with me. Um, so yeah, she's she's phenomenal. University of Texas met her at Abel's. Cain and Abel. <laughs> See, there's so much. We need to do another. We got a whole other hour. We can talk, man. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, she goes with me, and then my son, who's playing at Trinity, uh, he plays up there as well. So it's a, a great family atmosphere. I love and, it. I love it. I didn't realize that. I think your son is in one of the pictures we saw in the open. Um, Trinity, man, what a beautiful campus there in San Antonio. Good program, and you you coach against them now, don't you? I know. Yeah, it was crazy. <laughs> so it was it was cool, man. So. Uh, yeah, I coach, you know, we, we played against each other on a Tuesday night. We're not, we're not in the same conference, which is good, um, but it worked out perfect. So he was three for four. He had two doubles, a couple RBIs, and we won. So it worked out great. You know, every all, all our players were happy. Coaches were happy because they're like, what do you want to happen? I'm like, well, obviously I want him to get four hits. And they're like, yeah, I mean, but I said, but I want us to win. And they're like, okay, well, that's fine. <laughs> oh my god that's tough though but hey everybody's everybody's happy and humors at all it's a, a true baseball family in every sense of it no, hey, no. before we leave i want to try to get the, i got to show you something i'm not sure if you saw this or not we all know el arroyo has some classic signs have you seen today's i have not seen today's no oh my god oh here it is here it is my friend i i literally laugh and i, I approximately 30 seconds straight when I saw this. <laughs> I can't, it says your body, what? Let me see if I can move it. Hold on a second. Let me see if I can move that around a little bit. It says, here, let me pull this down. So oh, there it is. <laughs> <laughs> Wow, they up their game today, man. Boy, what is that? They hey, they did not care about anybody who was offended, and I like it. 
No, man. Oh, man. Like we went all in today. That's hilarious. Somebody replied to me. I put it on Twitter. Of you know, everybody. You know, everybody's angry on Twitter usually. Uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Somebody said, uh, "I just want you to know this is what you call a snart." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that's hilarious. Man. Oh my god, Todd Haney! Next time we do this, we're gonna go to the place where you and your better half met, where it all started. We got to do it. Sounds Can't good. Yeah, we got to part two or part three, whatever oh, we need. We we may make this a permanent monthly occurrence, <laughs> in my opinion. Oh my god! Hey, for the Longhorn legend, now he's a uh, stories inside the man cave VIP alumni for. V. Todd Haney and the OG Man Cave Boys, that being Big Mike, Coach Mo, and the Hardball Harge. We are out. You see the drippy, I'm fitted up. I'm in my car in the giddy up.